Please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténganse alejado de las puertas. Hey everyone, welcome to Al's Adventures. So I recently had a chance to sit inside my favorite monorail again, Monorail Lime, the one I got my wings in. And I got to thinking during that, or right after taking those pictures, that I think it'd be cool to do a video describing what it is to be a monorail pilot because out of all the questions I get from my channel, that's probably one of the more common ones. So I guess it's high time I did a video about that. So stay tuned if you're interested in uh, a little bit how to become a monorail pilot, uh, what the job entails. And this is going to be more of like a nuts and bolts uh, video. So just to give you like more of what you really want to know about the job, not just, you know, yeah, you're driving around and stuff. This is going to be the real nuts and bolts. So hope you enjoy it. So I'm just going to go about this and kind of like the questions that I, that I get from my channel. So how do you apply to become a monorail pilot? So pretty simple. You go on to the Disney website. You can, uh, you can call up uh, 407W Disney, hit the jobs thing, or just easier to go online. You apply for monorail pilot. What are the qualifications for monorail pilot? They want you to have a driver's license, not so much because driving a monorail, you're driving it with a stick, but really what it comes down to is you're going to be driving the van back and forth from the shop. More about that later. Uh, so it's more about driving the vehicles to and from the monorail than it really is driving the monorail. Obviously, you need a clean driving record. So if you have a driving abstract, bring that to it. That's how I got the job originally. But that's for another video. So that's question number one. Another common question, what is the training like or what does that pertain to? So essentially, once you're taken on as a monorail pilot, the first thing you're going to learn is platform training. And platform training, if you love the monorail, I'm sure I don't have to tell you how things work over there, but basically the first thing you're going to learn is platform. And what that means is you're going to learn how the train station actually works. You're going to learn how to open and close the station. You're going to learn how to put the, uh, the, the handicap uh, ramp down for the folks to get off and on with the ECVs and things like that. You're going to learn the workings of the station. You have a kill switch for the station. They'll teach you how to work with that. Obviously, you'll be learning the radio as you go along. But the great thing about all this is that you have a trainer all the way along the way. Uh, usually, you're trained with three or four people in this in this side of things. So it's kind of a lot of fun. You, everyone's learning together. No one's really, you know, uh, going in and knows everything. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. So you'll enjoy that part of it. All right, so the next thing, the thing you want to really know, learning how to drive the monorail. So basically, it's a three-week course, and I don't know if they still do it this way. Back when I learned how to drive the monorail, not a lot of people wanted to be drive trainers. I know I never did because I ended up going on Dream Squad into it, so I never did that. But the reason why a lot of people didn't want to become drive trainers was because here's the thing in monorail. If you go through three red lights in the course of, I think it's 12-month period, uh, probably even less now because since the accident, that's, that's for later down the road. But um, if you go through too many red lights in a certain amount of time, like you would in a car, you automatically get what they call force transferred. So you don't want to go through any red lights. But don't worry about that. If you drive normally and you drive saying, I never went through one, you're not going to have that problem. It's only for the few cowboys that end up going on there that end up doing that. But uh, you're not going to have to worry about that. So drive training, what does it entail? It's three weeks uh, of a course. Um, probably the hardest thing about drive training is the thing that kind of is hardest for most people. It's not really driving the monorail because you're driving it with the stick and it's it's not really, it's on the beam, obviously. You got to be careful and you got to watch your mirrors and things. But the hardest thing to master is typically the radio because it's run by, obviously, it's a, it's a big vehicle. It's uh, 220 passengers can fit in there, guests as we like to call them. And... Everything that you say on the radio is recorded into what they call the black box, which is really in an airplane, an orange box, so they can find it. But everything is recorded for the National Transportation and Safety Board. So if there were to be an accident, everything is recorded, obviously. So what that means is, is that you have to be able to uh, re repeat back three different commands. Now, as you do your training, you're going to learn stuff like the hold points as each beam has a number on it and certain ones like Magic Kingdom is 66 and you always hold at that one. So they're gonna, you'll learn that as you go on. That's really not a big deal. It's kind of repetitive. But what happens is, is that you get three chances to pass your drive training. And if you don't pass it in the third time, you don't get fired from the company. You'll just get transferred to a different division. But it's really very, very fair. And like I said, the hardest thing is the radio. Uh, essentially, what you're going to have to do is repeat back three commands, which is essentially 
uh, they would tell you something like monorail blue, go to hold point 66, hold and notify. And after that, uh, proceed into the Magic Kingdom station, hold and notify. And after that, uh, switch ends, which means turn off one end and start the other end up. And what you're going to have to do is repeat all that back to what they call central. So it sounds complicated. It's, it's not really as complicated as it really sounds because the more you do this, uh, once you're doing it a couple of months especially, you find that they do the same thing every single night. And it, it becomes like a, like a ballet, just like you'd see a, uh, like a movie or you'd see a ballet or something like that. It's all done the same essential way. So it sounds hard, but it's really not that hard. And once you do it, just take it with a grain of salt. It's really not that bad, trust me. Maybe you have a question about shift hours. Well, shift hours, everything in Disney kind of works off of seniority. So when you're hired for Disney, you're going to have a number. So I don't remember how many people were in uh, monorail. Say it's 500 people are working in monorail. So when you come in, you're going to be number 500. So every six months, they do what they call bid picks. So obviously the first time around, you're going to be 500. You're not going to really be able to pick, you know, you could. I mean, you go through it. You'll, you'll put like a wish pick in there and stuff of what you'd like. But essentially, you're not going to really probably get what you want. So generally, you're probably going to be doing closes or opens or whatever. But Disney is a funny place. And there's so many different people working there that sometimes you'll go in and they're going to say, wow, you're going to get terrible shifts. You're going to really be, you're going to, you know, get like, for instance, me, I love working what they call mid shift. So that's basically two, three o'clock in the afternoon till a close, 12, one o'clock in the morning, whatever. So like, if that's what you like to do, that was fine for me because that was like, great. That's what I would have picked anyway. Um, I, when I when I worked security, I had a friend of mine. He had the highest seniority in security, and he didn't want to be off on the weekends. He you know he he basically wanted to be off on Wednesdays and Thursdays because he was a troop leader and they did a lot of stuff you know for he, the meetings and stuff like that. So a lot of times you really don't you know you really can't go by that. So just kind of go with it. And Disney is really really good. They give you a wish list in terms of what you you know for instance like they'll give you a wish list as to do you want to work, uh, you know, Epcot Beam? Do you want to work resorts? Do you want to work morning? Do you want to work night? And they really try to accommodate you. They do a good job of that. And then because it's Florida and because it's Disney and it's a theme park and it's hot and people get, there's so many jobs at Disney and people always looking to do something else and they get excited to go and do a different thing, teach traditions or whatever. You'll be surprised how fast seniority wise you move up. And of course, if you get a promotion, you can move up too. You, you know, it's after six months, you can be a coordinator. So don't really worry about that either. If you're having fun and you're enjoying it, not really a big deal. Uh, random question I get too, how many monorails? Like people who know monorails know that there's 12 monorails. And where do you, where do we, where do you park them? Well, behind Space Mountain, and you might have ventured on this road along the way. It's kind of like closed off to guests technically, but because Disney University is back there and there's a residence back there and stuff, people can kind of wander back there. And um, so anyway, the monorail roundhouse is right near Disney University. It's near what they call Facilities Way. It's a big building. I'll put a picture of up here. These are all pictures, as a matter of fact, that I got off of Google um, as a cast member. I'm not, I'm not in the company anymore, but uh, you don't want to be taking pictures if you're a cast member. Disney gets very aggravated with that, and you can get written up with that. So these are all pictures, and I want to go back and work there one day. So these are all pictures I got off of Google, but trust me, this is the roundhouse. And right below the roundhouse is the uh, where they park the steam engines. So monorails on top, steam engines on bottom. Fascinating building. Uh, 12 monorails in all, and they could fit, I'm going to say we, we could fit nine of them inside the actual roundhouse. And the other three monorails will stay out. One will stay at Epcot, maybe. One will stay at Magic Kingdom. One will stay at Ticket and Transportation Center, whatever. They decided, and it's random, depending on what color or whatever. Another question that I oftentimes get is, when can people sit back in the bubble? Now, I was really lucky. When I drove monorail, I drove it right before the Year of a Million Dreams. Uh, actually, I, I started driving it when, it was, when that started. So anyway, that was 2007 when I started driving the monorail. Uh, I was kind of lucky. It was 7707. I don't know if that meant anything. But anyway, we were able to put people in the bubble back then, which is in the front. And it was fantastic. And that was, I love guests. And it's my favorite thing to deal with the guests and work with them. 
So after the accident, and I'm not going to go into this whole thing because if you know monorail, you probably know about that. That on uh, it was what was it seven five two thousand and nine monorail pink backed up into monorail purple and one cast member passed away so as a result of that they don't allow guests to go in the front bubble anymore and i really wish they would um maybe one day it'll happen again i really hope it would but uh currently it's not happening so anyway hopefully one day all right so i just had a thought i wanted to finish my thought on the drive training if you uh, join Monorail, and if it's like it was before, drive training might take a little bit of a while. You might be on platform a little bit, maybe longer than you want. Hopefully not too long. Like I was telling you, the drive trainings on Disney for the Monorail, years ago when I learned, there was only like three trainers for the morning, three at night. And the reason for that was, I was telling you about the red lights. The rule on Disney, at least back then was, was that if I became a drive trainer on Disney and I was training you, then if you went through a red light while you were training, you weren't listening, it went on my record. So a lot of people, you know, and you only get like a dollar or two extra an hour to do training for Disney. I, mean, I love doing training. The only division I didn't do it in was monorail because like I told you, when I was on monorail, I went over to guest relations and then found myself loving operations and I stayed in security and then I ended up cross training into merchandise. But um, that's the only reason why I didn't do it. I would have probably done it certainly on monorail, but that's why a lot of people don't do it. So if you're waiting a little bit of a long time, that's the reason. So the inevitable question that I always get, and uh, which I actually can speak on this, uh, the, the monorail accident of 2009. So first off, I want to say that I think as far as my recollection goes, there's only been two people ever killed uh, on the monorail or associated with the monorail. One was a guy who had fallen, who was a, a track guy, beam guy, who had fallen, didn't secure his harness. I think he fell down. That was one. The other one was um, a cast member who died when the monorails collided. So that being said, the monorail is probably, definitely the safest division, safest place you could work, safest place you could be as a guest out of all the places in and around Disney. The, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You'll learn about this in training. But the Maple system uh, that they named after Mary Poppins, because if you didn't know this or not, the Mary Poppins movie paid for the Florida Project. It did so well. Disney had the money they needed to do all that. So they nicknamed the safety system the Maple system, Mary Poppins. And that is an amazingly safe system. It was designed way back, you know, before Walt Disney World opened. And they kept updating it. And... The fact of the matter is, is if you have, they call it the block system because just picture like a city block, right? So each monorail, if there's a, if there's a monorail within a city block of each other, the system automatically puts up a red light. And if you try to drive a monorail through that red light, it automatically cuts everything off. The monorail just abruptly stops. You get written up because obviously if there's people in the monorail, they're going to be thrown around. They might fall down. They might get hurt. There's been instances of people breaking a wrist when someone does something like that. So it's a big infraction. But the result of the matter is, is the monorails don't crash. So why did the monorails crash on July 5th, 2009? Well, just a brief overview. You could read up on this. Ultimately, they blamed the guy who was in the shop for the uh, infraction because he said that the switch was down and it really wasn't. Uh, everybody was tired that night. I was working that night. I was working a security detail that night. My friend who I was in drive training with was actually driving monorail pink. He was in the monorail that backed up into monorail purple. And essentially what happened was the guy in the shop said the switch was down. It wasn't. He thought he was backing up on one beam. He backed up on the other beam. And let me tell you, it was the strangest, oddest, weirdest Perfect storm you could ever, and perfect storm not meaning it was perfect, meaning it was ridiculous. So many crazy bad things happened that night in that incidence that, for instance, the coordinator who normally sits in the control tower at the Ticket and Transportation Center, he didn't feel well, so he left. He would have seen this thing happening, monorail on the same beam, he would have cut the power. The cast members who all worked the, the station all have a kill switch. None of them noticed the monorail backing up. My friend Alan, who was driving monorail pink, for some reason didn't look in his mirrors. Um, the guy in the shop who never made a mistake, 
I'm not going to mention, I mentioned one guy's name, you could look this up, but only because he's my friend. Um, but the guy in the shop never made a mistake. He made a mistake that night. Um, the guy, the, the kid who was actually in Monorail Purple who passed away, no fault on him. He was texting. He was just waiting. They told him to hold and notify. He wasn't paying attention. He was texting. If he Had he been watching, he would have seen the Monorail approaching. Um, just so many strange, weird things that happened with that incident. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that. But just so you know that this was in a the most crazy, ridiculous, weird thing that ever happened in, in the course of Monorail. And because of that, they don't put guests in the front anymore. But just so you know, it was a very strange thing. And it probably would never, ever happen again. It, it's like, I don't know, winning the lottery and getting hit by lightning and whatever all at the same time. And uh, so enough of that. Next question. Oh, based on the last section, you might be wondering how the crash actually happened if uh, you have the Maple system. Well, when you're at when you're at the switch, which this one switch there is one, there's a couple of switches, but that's why this happened. The guy, when you're at a switch, you can, uh, there's, a, there's a Maple override feature where when you're in the monorail and the shop tells you, you can Maple override, you, there's a red button on the monorail panel. You can look back on it and I'll show you that uh, you press that button and you go like very, very slow, three to four miles an hour over the switch. And this is what happened. Uh, they told him it was okay. He Mapo overrode it. And um, this is how that happened. So normally that would never happen. So if you're wondering how that happened in that whole situation, I figured I'd clarify that. Oh, so you're probably wondering what happened with the lawsuit. Again, you could look all this up. Oh, and I just want to let you know that all the photographs that are in this video, I took off of Google uh, as a cast member. They don't want you taking photographs, especially backstage. So all of these I took off of Google. They're not mine. Uh, I want to. I haven't worked for the company in a couple of years. I worked with them for ten years. I do want to work for them again one day. So I would never risk um, taking photographs and putting them on. So these are all available on Google. That's where I got them from. So you might be wondering what happened with the lawsuit. Uh, it, it was a non-disclosure agreement, but essentially. Disney was at fault, as uh, far as I could read, and the essential thing was that they there was a lot of things that happened, but at the end of the day, one of the things they used was, and you know, it's funny, Disney's a magnificent, wonderful company, but sometimes they cut costs in very strange ways. When the monorail system first came out, Bombardier, or Bombardier, whatever way you want to describe it, it's a Canadian company, they have a safety handbook, and in the safety handbook that was issued with the monorails, they had told Disney that whenever you back monorails up, which again, Disney, they don't do it as often now. They did a heck of a lot for most of the time, you know, that monorails have been in existence. Bombardier in the safety manual said, whenever you back a monorail up, you need to have a spotter in the back of the monorail. Now, Disney in its infinite wisdom, you know, you know they, they never wanted to pay for a spotter in the back of the monorail and... Because this, this feature was in that safety guide, I think that was the basis of the fact of why the ruling went against Disney. And um, so I don't know what the exact amount was, um, but uh, the, the young guy passed away and his mom had the lawsuit going. So anyway, be that as it may. Oh, so I just thought of something else. What happens when the monorail gets stuck? You know, because monorail works off of electric. Well, they have a couple of diesel tractors, I think three of them. And uh, that I never had to be pulled out with the tractor. I was really, really lucky on monorail. Uh, I always treated them like um, like gold. I always treated them like ladies and um, never had a train problem. Most I had to do was a restart outside the contemporary and 30 seconds, it was about it. And um, anyway, so if the monorail gets stuck and uh, whatever, they pull out the diesel tractor and pull you back to shop with the diesel tractor. I'll show you a picture of it. So I think I covered everything on this video for Monorail. Um, don't forget the slogan for Monorail, we move the magic. I thought it'd be funny to show you. I love Monorail, love Disney. Let me just show you my truck, show you that even though I'm not currently driving Monorail, it never goes too far from my heart. Check. So of course, these are currently available at Disney. My other ride is a Monorail. Uh, I'm a big fan of Figment. I love Figment. He's the unofficial mascot of Disney, of Epcot anyway. And then show you our Disney hobby. Some people would call it an addiction. But those are our annual pass holder things there. And uh, anyway, so thank you for joining me on Al's Adventures. Hope I answered all your monorail questions. If you have any questions, uh, email me, wafflesfoundation at gmail.com. It's a non-for-profit that we run. 
and um, well, drop a comment on here. And I'll see you on the monorail beam. Take care, folks. Thanks for joining me. Have a magical day. Bye-bye.